Here we're looking at plant production and what it takes to initially get plants started so that ideally they can grow well during the season and you can get a bountiful harvest off them. And we see a nice collection of fruits and vegetables here. I'm going to speak in generalities, but a lot of these things can apply and you can take them as reference points for whatever specific crop you're looking at growing. So starting with the main summary, our goal is to turn this into this. We need some way to take our fruits of our labor, literally speaking, and generate a, some sort of profit to not only support the farm, but our activities may be off season and to allow us to have financial income to grow the following year. So it all starts with a seed, but not always because there's grafted plants. So you get to decide what you plant. Now, certain market demands may require you to grow uh, certain types of crops, but specific varieties is where you come in and can make that decision. Grafted plants are worth considering. We see some examples of some grafted tomatoes here. They're disease-resistant rootstock, meaning the bottom portion here, the roots in the soil can be resistant to certain soil-borne diseases. And there's a better tasting portion on top. Because oftentimes the top portion that might be better tasting may not have the disease resistance that we want. Versus the plants that are disease resistant may not have the taste we want. So grafting, we kind of get the best of both worlds, literally. The downfall of grafted plants is they do cost more, but in the end, it might be worth that cost. Remember, if you do grow grafted plants, to leave this graft union above the soil line. Particularly with tomatoes, if you bury this graft union below the soil line, roots will form from the top section, and you'll lose the ability of the advantage, I should say, of having that graft union. So what's to select? There's so many um, seed catalogs, so many seeds, so many different varieties. How do you kind of go about developing a selection for what you're actually going to plant? So what to look for is so just some things. The descriptions will always provide you the best quality. So keep that in mind when you're reading the seed catalog. Every seed sounds like you can do no wrong because you're supplying with the best qualities. Plant behavior is important to make sure it'll fit your growing situation for planting purposes. You want to be careful on some varieties, whether it's a bush or a vine, that can impact your row spacing. Not saying one's better than the other, but just be aware uh, if you're buying a bush variety, they tend to be more compact, and a vine variety tends to spread out more. Vegetable seed selection tips. We want to be looking for certain things. Disease resistance, if we can get it. Your market interest, because if you grow it and you can't sell it, there's no point. Flavor, this can be subjective. And then plant behavior. Is it a tall plant, a vining plant, a spreading plant? And the reason why I have the picture of the horses here, we want to take kind of all the horses and select what we think is going to be the winner for our situation. It may not always be the winner all the time in every grower's situation, but for your specific conditions, you want to pick what you think is going to best fit in with all of your other constraints you may have. Disease resistance is a big one. Uh, it's a very important feature to look for. This can actually save the crop with no needed inputs from you. There's a typical key, and each manufacturer uh, may have a slightly different um, key, but this is some very common ones where it's psyllium wilt, fusarium, rootnet nematodes, tobacco mosaic virus. This is example one farmer went out to visit. It was tomatoes. And we could see the tomatoes here, uh, the plants at least, look pretty well shot. The plants here, immediately where the stake is, from this row down, look very healthy. This was a tomato variety. I believe it was a mountain, mountain merit. Uh, when it first came out and late blight came in, you could see how devastating this was. Here's a grower that didn't have to spray anything. By choosing just a certain variety that was resistant to the disease, they're able to get a much healthier plant versus the ones that were not resistant. So I mentioned the terms resistance. You may see resistance some manufacturers may call tolerant. These are not interchangeable terms. Tolerant means that the plant may get the disease, but typically will survive. Resistant translates to, in most cases, it will not contract the disease at all. So if you have the option of a tolerant plant or a resistant plant, choose the resistant plant because it's more likely to survive uh, than a tolerant plant. Open up a seed catalog. I can't stress this. Don't try them all. There's 8 million different varieties, it seems like, and you're trying to select one, two, three, four, not a thousand, not a hundred, not grow a bunch and see what makes it. Uh, try to be selective on the varieties that you do give a try. Realize that each year is different, so before you commit to just one variety, try it for multiple years and develop an idea of your standard variety for comparison. So 
Is it better than what you grew last year? Do you have a variety that you really like? That can offer your comparison. For me, I use, for example, Better Boy Tomatoes. That's kind of my comparison. How does it compare to the Better Boy? Is it taller? Is it more disease resistant? Uh, does it produce quicker yields, more uniform yields, so on and so forth? That's my example of my tomato variety comparison. If I want to try something new, I always plant it next to a Better Boy variety and see how it performs. Get in the conduct of seeds versus transplants. So again, pros and cons to everything. Seeding, very easy, can avoid root disturbance. The cons is the fear of the unknown. If you put a bunch of seeds in the ground and crows come through behind you and pick the seeds out of the field, yes, that's happened to me. Uh, you're looking a week later and you're wondering why there's nothing germinating. Transplanting, the advantage is you have an instant field to go right through and what was empty in the morning can be fully um, complete with plants by the afternoon. Avoids potential animal damage because you've got the, seed, the transplants, not the seeds, going right in the ground. The con to this, though, is there's more time caring for the seedlings as a hardening off process. If you're seeding, you don't have to go through and get the big seeder here. This is an example of a large-scale corn seeder. You can hand seed a field, no problem. If you are going to do transplants, you want to have an adequate germination environment. You want to make sure it's warm, well-lit, good air circulation, and easy access. Be done in the basement. That's not a problem. There's just a bunch of tomato plants uh, being grown for a winter. Uh, warm is a relative term. It doesn't have to be super hot. Just warm, well-lit. You see a bunch of different lights here. Good air circulation is important. You don't want it in a closed environment and easy access uh, in and out for you. I want to start with a good seed starting mix, seed starting mix. Uh, potting soil should be selected. Seed starting mix has finer um, versus regular just potting soil. It's better for seed to soil contact to get the moisture content there. So you want seed starting mix, not necessarily potting soil. It's a little finer and it, uh, is especially good for those smaller seeds. Trays are often used. You want to select the appropriate size to maximize the area but not restrict the seedling growth too much. Be sure to label them all uh, so you don't get confused or move one for some reason and then realize, oh, I don't remember what variety that was. We see here also labels in every pots. Here, every tray is labeled. That's an important thing. Time is money. Standardize your trays and add a dibbler to help speed up the production. Yes, there's little hand dibblers you can use, but this is just some dowels um, and a piece of wood. You flip this over, Immediately puts a hole the right depth to all the trays at the same time. You drop all your little seeds in, and you go on to the next tray. Again, that speed, efficiency, and standardizing your trays, that planning process is important. It helps you in the long run. Germination. Once a seed emerges, they will need light. So grow lights have the proper spectrum compared to regular house lights. There's many options when you're looking at lighting. This is what the um, plants absorb. You can see not a lot of green. It, the chlorophyll is strong in the kind of the bluish spectrum spectrum and also the um, red spectrum. Different Kelvin temperature charts, you can get different um, types of lights will produce different color temperatures. There's many options. I'm going to go through a few of them and compare uh, some just so you have an idea. But LED, um, metal halides, high pressure sodiums, fluorescent and natural light are the common options. Comparing LEDs, which look like these purple kind of lights, compared to metal halides or high pressure sodium. This happens to be high pressure sodium, it produces kind of that more orange color. Metal halides produce a whiter light. Advantage to the LEDs, though, low power consumption, efficient spectrum. You can actually dial in spectrums here. The cons are they are quite expensive, and they don't cover a whole lot of area. Metal halide and, hel and HPS, uh, high-pressure sodiums, are easy to find. Typically, one bulb will cover a 5x5 five five area. The cons are power consumption, though. Uh, they do consume quite a bit of power, and they generate a lot of heat, so those should be taken into consideration. Fluorescence versus natural. Fluorescence, relatively low power consumption, can fit easily over seed trays, but they need to be kept really close to the seedlings. You want to put them on a hanging um, chain so you can raise them as the plants grow upwards. Um, and not good for long-term growth. They don't really produce a lot of light. Natural's free, can reduce hard enough time. It's great. But when you're starting your seeds and germinating them, it could be short day lengths, and that could cause issues. Can also all cause temperature spikes, uh, really hot, get hot during the day and cool off at night. So again, just something to consider. Most of the growers I see do use the fluorescence, um, so just use that as comparison. The hardening off that I mentioned, especially if you're using fluorescence or kind of a weak um, intensity in light, you want to make sure the plants are coming from a protected to a consistent environment, that they're re ready for the extremes of outside. Light, temperature, of the outside world, wind, it can seem like a desert, even though you might be watering them, 
Uh, if you keep them inside, that's where the air circulation is important, keeping a breeze on them, uh, harding them off, getting them exposed to natural sunlight before just putting them outside from the basement. Transplanting and early protection, you want to consider temperature swings, water stress, humidity, uh, and temperature related animals such as crows and mice attacking the plants. You could go through, if you're really labor intensive, make little huts to put over the um, new transplants. Here we see a grower here that has weed blocked down, walking boards so they don't come back to the soil, and they set up these little plastic kind of um, walls. This prevents wind damage, especially on these large leaves, wind damage from current occurring and knocking the plant over, causing damage. The top is left open so there's not a temperature consideration or um, reason for concern, but the sides are protected and help harden them off in the way of wind damage. Plant requirements. How tall is it going to get depends on the variety that you select, so consider this when you're seed selecting. Do you need hoops for early season protection? Um, they can support shade cloth as a way to harden off some plants. It may take a little bit longer, and they can also hold insect netting. So you might, may want to just go outside and immediately cover them with in, for insect netting. Especially important for cucumber beetles, um, for squash plants, especially on later plantings, uh, squash bugs. You can even protect them from aphids if you have a small enough mesh size. So just, again, things to consider when you're going to be transplanting outside. In-season care, trellising or weaving. You could see the stakes here. Do you have the materials is a good question. Oh, the tomatoes need staking. Let me go buy some stakes. Well, odds are a lot of other people have that same idea and you may not be able to get the stakes you need. Weeding, what method are you going to select for weeding? I have another video on weeding. Are you going to use just regular organic kind of hay mulch here? Or are you going to use plastic? Pruning. For tomatoes in particular, how are you going to do it? A single liter, double liter, uh, no pruning, heavy pruning? It all depends. Harvesting, how often and at what stage are you going to harvest? You can pick tomatoes at what's called the breaker stage with a little pink on the bottom, or wait for them to get fully red. Again, all decisions you need to make and develop a plan for. Net harvest. You want to consider when you're harvesting field heat. You typically want to harvest in the early morning or late evening. Midday can cause them to dry out pretty quick. Uh, they contain a lot of heat from the sun, particularly in the summer, and it's going to reduce storage time. How often do you want to be harvesting? At what stage do you want to harvest? It depends on your market, whether you're doing a farmer's market, a wholesale, um, a CSA, community-supported agriculture, or something else, uh, restaurants, all can influence this. But again, things you want to have in your plan for consideration. For example, summer squash require continual harvests. You know, people can do those almost every day. Tomatoes can be harvested before fully ripe at what we call the breaker stage. This is starting to get a little pink um, at the bottom here. If you're doing berry crops, again, they can be very labor-intensive. Uh, you want to pick them uh, when they're kind of basically fully ripe, but have an idea what's ripening, uh, so you can have an idea what you'll have for a harvest. In post-harvest, storage of the crop. So you're great, you harvest it, where is it going to go? And after you're done with the crop, field cleanup. This can often be left to the very end of the season, but certain crops, if they're if you're done with them, you want to find a way to basically remove them or kill them off. They can herbal, harbor disease or other insects. Uh, cool bots or some type of refrigeration system is a great thing to be putting into your plan and considering uh, so you can cool and remove that field heat. Large stackable storage bins that have good air circulation, also important and worth consideration. So again, this is, comes back to that planning, that time investment, and having an idea of what's going to occur over the entire season.